On our last show, we had an interview with one of our favorite guests, Richard Winger, where we started a discussion of uh, ballot access highlights from 2014. And in our last segment, which I recommend to you if you haven't seen it, we talked about a very exciting election victory in Oregon. And we talked about some interesting legislative victories, uh, one in California um, and uh, some smaller victories in some other states. Uh, in today's segment, we're also going to talk about highlights of ballot access from 2014, but we're going to talk about some important court decisions. Uh, as you can tell, ballot access is fought on many fronts. It's, it's, it's fought at the ballot box. It's fought in the legislative level. It's fought in the courts. In fact, I, I guess it's fought in the courts more than anywhere, um, because even when there's a legislative result, sometimes that has to be challenged. So uh, we're going to talk about these court decisions today. And again, our guest is Richard Winger. Richard is the publisher of Ballot Access News, and uh, I don't think, arguably, I think he's without a doubt the, the nation's leading expert on ballot access issues. So, Richard, uh, welcome back again. Okay, thanks, Steve. Always a pleasure to have you. And today we're going to talk about some court decisions. I know there's three in particular that you found most interesting from 2014. One is in Pennsylvania, so why don't we start there? On July 9th, we had a really good outcome in the Third Circuit, the U.S. Court of Appeals. Um, ever since 2004, there's been a new terrible threat to minor parties and independent candidates in Pennsylvania. In 2004, the state government dreamed up the system which says if you turn in your petition, your minor party and independent candidate, you need maybe 25,000, 30,000 signatures, and you turn in a petition, and if it doesn't have enough valid signatures, the group can be liable for up to $110,000 in court costs. And this, ha this happened first to Ralph Nader. In 2004, he turned in 50,000 signatures, just hoping he had 25,000 valid. And in Pennsylvania, all petitions are assumed to be okay unless somebody challenges, and if somebody challenges, it goes straight to court. This is completely unlike the system in any other state. In any other state, election officials would check the petition, and, you know, they're professionals, and they would give us an answer. Either well, Like a board of elections or some group that was specifically in charge of the election-type issues. We'll hear, we'll hear it first. Sure. Yeah, but, okay. But in Pennsylvania, there's no such step. It has to go to court. So when it gets to court, they drag in court reporters. They're expensive. Handwriting experts, they're expensive. And uh, by the time the process is over and the court has to go through every single signature, maybe 50,000 of them, it takes a month, that adds up the court costs. And so Nader was told he didn't have enough valid signatures, and therefore he had to pay court costs to the people who challenged his petition, and it was $87,000 he owed. So A, he's not on the ballot. B, he owes all this money. Then they did it in 2006 to the Green Party candidate for governor. And he was a not a wealthy person, but still he was told he had to pay $85,000 too just for trying to get on the ballot. He has to suffer almost to the point of bankruptcy. We've sued three times and finally the Third Circuit said the minor parties do have standing to challenge this whole system. Now we haven't won the case yet but the point is they made it pretty plain that they think it's unconstitutional. So they sent it back to the U.S. District Court and we're pretty confident that we're going to win and Pennsylvania's going to have to stop doing this. Uh, because I guess if you have this, uh, this big uh, fee hanging over your head, that would dissuade people from running for office knowing that they might have to go out of pocket big time. That's exactly right. Pennsylvania has not had any minor party or independent candidates in the ballot for statewide office in each of the last three midterm elections. And it's, it's the only state for which that's true. And before because before people, they started this, were there independents on the ballot? Uh, yes, there were. Okay. There was always minor party and independent candidates in the ballot in Pennsylvania every two years before this started, going all the way back, probably 100 years. Um, I think we missed one, but 
anyway, people did turn in petitions in 2010 and 2014, and and then they were told, you'd better withdraw your petitions, or you may have the same thing happen to you. Do you think this will be resolved by the, by the time petitions have to be circulated in Pennsylvania for 2016? Yes. Yes, it'll be resolved in 2015. Now, conversely, I'm just curious, if someone in Pennsylvania, before the law would change, if they challenged you, but they were wrong, did they have to pay the cost no. for being wrong? No. The whole thing was dreamed up to get at Ralph Nader. Interesting. Because normally, although it may not play out that way, the system would be somewhat balanced, and no matter who loses the case, they have to pay the fees. In this case, it was just clearly... Uh, um, keeping some keeping people off the ballot, among other things. It's not symmetrical. In 2012, the Libertarians were challenged in Pennsylvania, and they they were brave. They did not withdraw. They went through the process, and the court said, "Yes, you have enough ballot signatures." But it doesn't work in reverse. The Libertarian Party did did not then get money from the challengers. Very interesting. Very interesting. All right, so moving on, Georgia, I know that's another one of your favorite cases from the year. Well, Georgia's petition for president is so severe, no group has managed to successfully petition in Georgia since 2000. So in 2012, the Green Party and the Constitution Party filed a lawsuit saying it's just too hard to get on the ballot for president in Georgia, and here's our evidence that nobody's done it since 2000. And the U.S. District Court dismissed the case before the state had even filed the answer. But the, the 11th Circuit, in January 2014, sent it back to him and said, do not dismiss this case, at least hold a trial, gather evidence. And so, so just like in Pennsylvania, we, ha we haven't won the case yet, but... This puts us in a very good position. And so after that happened, the state of Georgia was so upset, they asked for a rehearing in front of all the judges of the 11th Circuit, and that was denied. Then they went to the 11th Circuit again and said, well, at least suspend this decision until we ask the Supreme Court to reverse it. But the 11th Circuit denied that, too. So I think the Eleventh Circuit means what it says. They're sending a pretty, they're sending a pretty strong message. Yeah. So now it's been back, it's been back to the U.S. District Court for six months, and he hasn't done anything with it, which is <laughs> kind of frustrating. But I'm sure he will eventually. So, so I mean, where, it's his job. Where physically does the Eleventh Circuit sit? Atlanta. The Eleventh Circuit covers three states: Georgia, Florida, and Alabama. And, and where is the District Court in this case? Um, well, it's the district court in Atlanta. Oh, the both both are situated in Atlanta. Okay. Yeah, the Northern District. Gotcha. Um, so, what do you think the timeline is on this decision? Um, I would hope it would get going in the next few weeks or months. Oh, another good thing: the ACLU Voting Rights Office has taken over the case, and they have a lot of talent, prestige. They'll do a good job. And, you know, when the ACLU Voting Rights Office takes a case, that impresses the judges. Possibly the Georgia legislature will get the hint and ease the law this year. It's almost possible. That would be a very good outcome. Well, given the, um, the result of the U.S. Senate race in Georgia, which was very heavily contested, but there was a very low turnout, uh, do you think that will have, have an impact on how people approach this decision? Oh, it's tough to say. Um, Georgia is one of only two states that has a runoff after November if, if nobody gets 50%. Um, they don't like to hold runoffs. It's very expensive and not many people show up. Uh, they ought to switch to ranked choice voting. But uh, I, don't see the, I don't think there's any direct connection between that and, and the pending lawsuit. Okay, now in Tennessee, I think we said we hope that that'll be resolved in time for people to do their petitions. Do you think this one in Georgia will be resolved in time for people to get on the ballot to run for president? Yes, I do. Because if, if the election is drawing close, then courts are in the habit of expediting the case. 
they don't need to expedite it now because the next election is so far away. But, um, you know, they're not dumb. They know when the election is. They'll just make sure it gets done in time for the next election. By the way, by the way I, got, I mixed you up there. I meant to say Pennsylvania. I had Tennessee, oh. <laughs> I, I had Tennessee on the brain because we're going to go to Tennessee next. That'll be our last case we're going to talk about. Tell us what happened in Tennessee this year that made the highlights. Well, um, every state has a law on how a party stays on the ballot, which is a little different than the law on how it gets on the ballot. In other words, it's, it's just common sense. There has to be a law for both points. How do you get on and right. how do you stay on without right. having to start all over? So even though the federal courts have been pretty good about striking down laws that make it tough to get on, they've never struck down a law on how you stay on until this year a U.S. District Court in Tennessee struck down Tennessee's law and how you stay on the ballot. So that was great to have finally we broke through that barrier. Um, the basis for it was equal protection. In Tennessee, you have to get 5% of the vote for statewide office to stay in the ballot. But the law said an old party that was already on, they could, they could miss one election and it wouldn't hurt them. They just have to get 5% of the vote in either of the last two elections. But a new party has to get 5% its first year on the ballot or it gets dumped off. So the judge said, well, the new parties should have two chances also. Interesting. Now, on our last show, we talked about the impact of low voter turnout and how that might affect um, the number of petitions you might need in a few states. I think you said about a dozen and ballot initiatives. Um, how many parties, if any, do you know lost their standing this year because the turnout was so low? I would say the Libertarian Party of the District of Columbia lost its standing because of the terrible turnout. Because unlike almost every other place, the vote test for a party to stay in the ballot in the District of Columbia is not a percentage. It's a raw number. The party has to get 7,500 votes for one of the district-wide offices or it goes off the ballot. So it's the Libertarians got their 7,500 votes in 2012 when the turnout was high, but they lost it in 2014. And I would say it's kind of obvious. The fewer voters there are, the less likely any party is going to get 7,500 votes. Exactly. Yeah. Now, I talked to a gentleman the other day from Minnesota who ran as an independent, I think it is what the, effectively was the Jesse Ventura's party in Minnesota. He told me they have now fallen off for the next election, they did not get enough votes to stay in the ballot. It's really sad. I think they got 4.8% or 4.9% for one of the statewide races, and they needed 5%. I'd love to talk to anybody from the Independence Party of Minnesota to persuade them to ask the legislature to lower the vote test, because the median vote test of the 50 states is only 2%. And, you know, a party that got 4.8% of the vote for the statewide race it's obviously a real party. It deserves to be on the ballot. So I, I'd love to um, reach out to the Independence Party of Minnesota leaders and ask them to ask the legislature to lower the vote test. I don't. There's no reason it should be five percent when the median of the fifty states is two percent. Well, I'm hoping to do an interview with them on another show. So if they haven't talked to you by then, I'm definitely going to suggest they reach out to you and uh, have this conversation. Good. Well, Richard, you're, you're a terrific guest as always. You have this encyclopedic uh, uh, memory that uh, uh, is unparalleled. I know I always tell you you need to write a book or somehow journal all this together at some point. So uh, uh, Richard Winger on Ballot Access. I can see it sitting on my bookshelf right now. Okay, the time went real fast. Now, Thanks, one, thi Steve. one thing we forgot to do on the last show, and I apologize, is uh, have you tell the viewers how to sign up and get your uh, newsletter. Well, my, my newsletter is basically a print newsletter. It's a monthly. It's only $16 a year, and it's been coming out since 1985, so I've never missed an issue. You don't need to worry. You'll get cheated. <laughs> so, so I guess the easiest, the easiest way is to just Google ballot access news, 
and you can either send a check for sixteen dollars or use PayPal. Um, if you don't want to Google it, it's www.ballot and then a dash or a hyphen access.org ballot hyphen access.org and they there's a form to subscribe well i i can't recommend your service enough to the viewers particularly people that want to really drill down and understand this incumbency protection in this very uh, crazy world of ballot access so richard thank you as always you're a great guest thanks steve bye